This lecture is intended for Niklaus Children's Hospital Clinical and Officially Fellows. The topic is cutaneous electrical stimulation for neurophysiologic studies. This talk will be conducted in a question and answer format. The first question is, cutaneous electrical stimulation is used for all of the following except for A. Repetitive stimulation test B. H. Reflex C. Motor nerve conduction study D. P300 Cutaneous stimulation in neurophysiology is used for nerve conductions, late responses, somatosensory evoked potentials, and repetitive nerve stimulation tests. So the answer to this question is P300. Next question. Cations are always positive. Anions are always negative. Cathodes are always positive. Anodes can be positive or negatives. A true, B false. Cations are always positive and anions are always negative. The meaning of cathode and anode will change depending if we are referring to a battery or to a stimulator. In a battery, the cathode is the positive pole and the anode is the negative pole. In a stimulator, the cathode is the negative pole and is usually marked with black and the anode is a positive pole and is usually marked in red. So the answer to this question is false. A charge separating device and a discharging device use the same terminology with different connotation. A true, B false. A battery is a charge separating device. It stores electric energy by separating cations, that is positive charge ions, presented by the white circle with the blue positive sign in this, in this frame, and anions, that is negatively charged ions, represented by circles with a red negative sign. Notice that the terminal of the battery that contains an excess of cation, the positive terminal, is the cathode, as we previously mentioned. The other terminal containing an excess of an ion that is the negative terminal, is called an anode. And a stimulator is a discharging device. Notice that the terminal of the discharging device discharging anions, that is the negative terminal, is the, cath the cathode. The other terminal discharging cations, the positive terminal, is the anode. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. In biological tissue, the charges move with anions. A true, B false. This is a representation of a battery and an electrical circuit. Notice that the positive end of the battery is labeled cathode and the opposite side, that is the negative side, is labeled anode. Also notice that the flow of electrons takes place from the anode to the cathode, and that the flow of current, by convention, 
takes place from the cathode to the anode. Remember that a battery is an energy separating device, device. And also remember that the nomenclature used for the battery, a charge separating device is very different from the nomenclature used for the stimulators, such as the one we use in neurophysiology. Because in the stimulator, which is a current generator device, the positive pole is the anode, and the negative pole is the cathode. When the stimulator is switched on over a biological tissue, since current in biological tissue travel with the cations, current will flow from the anode to the cathode, as indicated by the yellow arrow. So the answer to this question is false. Next question, which of the following devices can be used for stimulating and recording? A. Ring electrode B. Bipolar stimulating electrode C. Bipolar bar electrode D. All of the above. There are many devices that can be used to stimulate nerves. Five of them are represented in this frame. The devices that can be used to stimulate and record are the ring and the disc electrodes. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. The typical distance between the cathode and the anode of a stimulator is dash centimeters. A, 1.5 to 2.5, B, 2.5 to 3, C, 1 to 1.5, D, 4 to 5. The distance between the anode and the cathode is 2.5 to 3 centimeters in most stimulators. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. The resting potential of a motor neuron, SOMA, and its axons are the same. A true, B false. The membrane potential at the soma in a neuron is minus 70. The membrane potential of the axon is minus 90. The difference is likely to result from the continuous synaptic influence in the soma of other neurons. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. Which of the following factors do not speed up conduction velocity? A. A faster rate of action potentials. B. An increased current flow along the axon. D. Higher depolarization threshold of the cell membrane. D. Higher temperature. Factors that increase conductions are Faster rate of action potentials Increased current flow along the axon Lower depolarization threshold of the cell membrane and higher temperature. So the answer to this question is C. It takes approximately dash microsecond for current to travel from one node of Ranvier to the next. A10, B20, C30, D50. Internode conduction is carried by electrotonic current. Since the distance between nodes of Ranvier is about one millimeter and current travels from one node to the next in about 20 microseconds, 
Conduction velocity is about 15 meter per second. So the answer to this question is 20. Next question. Stimulators under regular conditions produce depolarization under the dash. A anode, B cathode, C anode and cathode, D none of the above. I will address this question by telling you about four experiments. Here goes the first one. This figure shows a stimulator in the off position. Remember, this is a discharging device. The skin and the axons are marked. On your right hand, I have placed a recording device. Now the stimulator has been turned on with the appropriate intensity, let's say 15 milliamps for 100 microseconds and an action potential arises under the cathode. This action potential will generate a current that will travel in both directions and ultimately it will produce a wave in the recording device as shown in this frame. Now let's do experiment number two. Again, we start with an with the stimulator in the off position, but now we use pliers to crush the area of the axon below the anode. And then we turn the stimulator on again with 15 milliamps for a hundred microseconds. And again, an action potential will occur under the cathode, generating a current in both directions. The current will stop in the crush area, but the recording device will record the wave. Now, let's go to the third experiment. Let's go back on and put the stimulator off, but instead of crushing the area under the anode, this time we will put the pliers in the area below the cathode and crush that region. Now we turn the stimulator on and we have, as we have done in this frame, but no action potential is generated. And now I'm going to tell you about the fourth and final experiment. This time only the anode is placed on top of the nerve. If only a regular current is applied, let's say 15 milliamps for 100 microseconds, nothing will happen. But if a large amount of current is applied something that is not done under regular conditions, current will develop under the anode and generate an action potential. So the answer to this question is B, cathode. A relative membrane positivity must occur for the polarization to take place in an axon, A true, B false. Believe it or not, after so many years, we are not still 100% certain how the polarization happens under the cathode. As I see it, there are two possibilities. Is the action under the cathode activated by being convinced to depolarize or coerced to do so? Some say convinced. Those that say convincing explain it this way. As you know, the inner membrane surface of an axon is more negative than the outer membrane surface of an axon, as it is depicted in this frame inside the green rectangle. 
when the stimulator is turned on, the cathode attracts positive charges towards it, thus increasing the negative charges on the other surface of the axon as shown in this picture. The anode, on the other hand, attracts negative charges, thus increasing the positive charges outside the membrane just beneath the anode on the outside of the membrane. I refer to this process, the process of attracting charges of opposite polarity by the cathode and the anode as convincing. But as I previously said, although some believe this is the way a stimulator works, others argue that, they, that it doesn't work that way, that it works by coercing. I will explain coercing in the next few frames. Again, we start with the stimulator off. Once on, the cathode and the anode will discharge. So the cathode will discharge negative charges and the anode will discharge positive charges. Those producing the same consequence as convincing. I call this process coercion. The changes in the other membrane surface below the cathode and the anode, whether produced by convincing or coercion, will have two consequences. The first consequence is an increase in the positivity of the membrane outside the anode and the increase in negativity of the membrane outside the cathode will alter the ratio of charges in the membrane under the anode and under the cathode. On the, under the cathode, the membrane will turn more negative and under the anode, more positive. This fact will be referred to as relative positivity. You can appreciate it in this frame that the increased negativity under the cathode has changed the relation between the inner and the outer membrane, which is currently more positive under the cathode. And we can say, make the same argument for under the anode, but in the opposite direction. The second consequence is that the excessive ne negativity outside in the other surface of the axon below the cathode will attract the positive charges from below the anode while repelling the negative charges under it. By the same token, the excessive positivity outside in the membrane of the axon below the anode repels the positive charges from the inner membrane. Thus, these charges will end up on the opposite side of the stimulator prong. So, as you can see, the positive charges have moved from the inner membrane under the anode to the inner membrane under the cathode. The end result is that a significant positivity occurs under the inner surface of the axon under the cathode, to which we will refer to an absolute positivity. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. The unit most frequently used to measure intracellular potentials is microvolt. True or false? I think by now you are familiar with this figure. 
I will add to it two recording devices for cording determination. At rest, the inner surface of the axon below the anode and the cathode are negative, that is minus 90 millivolts. Immediately when activated by an appropriate stimulation, the inner surface of the axon below the anode will become more negative and the inner surface of the axon below the cathode will become more positive. Notice that the values are given in millivolts. An action potential will now occur under the cathode, which will further increase the number of positive charges under the cathode, which ultimately will trigger a current in both directions. So the answer to this question is false. The movement of charges across a membrane without ion crossing the cellular membrane is called capacitant current. A, true, B, false. As we previously mentioned, at rest, the inner surface of the axon below the anode, as well as the inner surface of the axon below the cathode, are negative. Their value is minus 90 millivolts. Once the stimulator is turned on, the excess of negative cations in the other membrane below the cathode will produce a capacitant current across the cellular membrane leading to an increased positivity. A simi similar but polarity dif different reaction will occur under the anode. Ultimately, the inner membrane under the cathode will be driven towards its depolarization threshold. And the membrane under the anode will become hyperpolarized. The change in voltage without movement of ions across the membrane is called capacitant current. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. A depolarization potential is triggered by opening of, so of the sodium channels in the axon membrane under the cathode. A true, B false. This drawing represents a voltage-gated sodium channel. The arrow indicates the voltage sensor which I have drawn on this cartoon on both sides of the channel. The arrow now points to the activating gate and now to the inactivating gate. The voltage sensor under the cathode following a stimulation Feel the excessive inner membrane positivity, which I have expressed by changing the value of the negative charges pointed by the arrow. They were negative before, as you can recall. This positivity felt by the sensor will trigger opening of the activating gate, thus allowing sodium to move through the channel and come out the other end in the inner side of the membrane. This is followed by movement of the inactivating gate until it closes the channel, then a few microseconds after 
an internal channel mechanism dislodges the inactivating gate while moving the activating gate towards the inner opening of the channel. And finally, the activating gate and the channel is ready for reopening again once the activating gate is closed and the inactivating gate is open. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. The initial movement of the membrane towards the polarization that precedes the action potential triggered by an electrical stimulation can be attributed to ionic current. A true, B false. With the stimulator of the resting membrane memory potential is negative, that is, to the level of minus 90. Notice that the excess of negativity charges pointed by the, by the green arrow. When the stimulator is turned on, the membrane potential goes to negative 40. This happens without the channels opening and it is the consequence of capacitor currents. Capacitance current refers to the current generated by changes in the balance of charges across the membrane that is not associated with ion going through the membrane channels. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. Usually it takes a rise of the inner axon membrane from negative 90 to negative 50 to trigger the opening of the voltage-gated sodium channels. A true, B false. At rest, the inner surface of an axon membrane is minus 90 and the activating gate is closed. Remember that the soma of the neuron is minus 70 but the axon membrane potential is minus 90. At about minus 50, the channel in the axon membrane will open. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Using the usual stimulation parameters, hyperpolarization occurs in the axon membrane under the anode, A true, B false. When the stimulator is on, hyperpolarization occurs under the anode as shown in this frame. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Another block does not occur in human being under routine clinical conditions. A true, B false. As attested by these two books, another block is not a problem during neurophysiological testing in regular conditions. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. To find the location where to put the cathode closest to the nerve being study, it is best to start with maximal stimulation. A true, B false. Finding the right place to stimulate takes a few steps. First, place the stimulator over the expected location of the nerve. Slowly increase the intensity of the stimulation until the first small potential is recorded. Keeping the stimulus current constant, move the stimulator parallel slightly to one side and then slightly to the other side. And fourth, keep on trying until you, you see one that is the highest response. The highest response is the place to put the stimulator to actually 
excite the nerve. I am representing this exercise in this frame. The magenta dot represents the position of the cathode. The cathode is being placed at the expected location where the nerve is supposed to be. This follows rule number one. In this frame, I am adding a flat white line, indicating no response. Notice that the stimulus use was 10 milliamps for 50 microseconds. Now the stimulus is increased to 11 milliamps for 50 microseconds. At this point, I am following the second rule. Again, in this hypothetical case, no response is obtained with this stimulation. Now the stimulator is increased to 12 milliamps with the same duration. And as you can see, depicted in this frame, a small wave appeared. We have complied with rule number two. Now I am going to comply with rule number three. And for this purpose, you move the cathode, keeping the stimulus constant. You move it to one side or the other side. And when you stimulate in this hypothetical example, uh, example a larger wave appears. This again is keeping with rule three. Next, we again move the cathode. In this case, the stimulus record a smaller wave. Thus, the prior location was the right location for stimulation. This complies with rule number four. Sometimes following this rule takes a few more steps than I have just shown you. One possible situation is when the right position is overshoot. I will give you an example. Let's say that at 10 milliamps for 50 microseconds, nothing happens. Nor anything happens when you increase the milliamps to 11. Then they are increased to 12 and a small wave appears. Then you move it towards the thumb and you get a smaller deflection, just as the first one. In this case, one possibility is that you may have bypassed the right location. And also what you should do then is place the stimulator between the two smaller res response responses and if you get a larger response then you are over the nerve and at the right place for stimulation or another possibility is that you do not get a large stimulation in which case you should continue to move the stimulator parallel in the direction of the thumb So the answer to this question is false. Next question. Which of the following classifications can be used to classify motor, sensory, and autonomic fibers? A. Gasser classification. B. Lloyd classification. C. Cutaneous classification. D. Motor classification. There are many nerve fiber classifications. They all have a long and winding history. In this frame, I have presented four of them. I think they are the ones most used. In the following frames, I will mention the different nerve types and I will use the first letter of this 
classification that you see in this frame, the ones that have color aqua, to indicate if the fibers discussed are included in the different classifications. Neurons for several cutaneous organs are in the dorsal ganglia. These nerves are classified in the gasser, loid, and cutaneous classification. Sensory fibers from muscle and tendons also have their body in the dorsal ganglia. They are classified in the gasser and in the loid classifications. Somatic motor fibers arise from the anterior horn of the spinal cord. They are classified in the gasser and in the motor classification. Preganglionic sympathetic motor fibers arise from the lateral horns. Postganglionic motor fibers arise from the paraventi paravertebral sympathetic ganglia or from freestanding ganglias such as the celiac ganglion. These fibers can only be classified using the gasser classification. Preganglionic sympathetic fibers housed in the lateral horns can also travel with the peripheral nerves to innervate the suprarenal gland. They can only be classified using the gasser classification. Parasympathetic motor fibers for the pelvic organs whose fibers travel with the peripheral nerves to the ganglia close to the pelvic organs can only be classified also using the gasser classification. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. How should large extrafusal muscle fibers be classified in the gasser classification? A. A. Alpha. B. 1. Alpha. C. 2. T. A. Gamma. If you are interested in nerve fiber classifications, stop the video and read this frame. If you're not, keep on running the video and I will give you a short version of the different classifications. Initially, Erlanger and Geyser classification was very easy. They divided the fibers in three types. In 1924, they studied the frog's sciatic nerves and they found that based on their conduction, they could divide it in three large groups. This is a photograph of their original finding. As you can see, they divided them into A, B, and C. Again, if you are interested in the subject, please pause the video and read this frame. Otherwise, just jump it. And take a look at this frame. This frame presents the gas classification as it stands now. The fibers are first divided between those that have myelin and those that do not. The ones with myelin are further divided into somatic labeled type A and autonomic labeled type B. These autonomic fibers include only autonomic preganglionic efferent fibers. 
somatic fibers are a larger group. They are further subdivided according to their experimental conduction speed into four groups represented by Greek letters. The gamma subgroup is considered to be not the true subgroup of group A fibers since the conduction of those fibers is more likely to be in the beta or the delta, or the delta range. The bottom line is that the gamma subgroup is currently not included in most classifications. Group B, as we previously mentioned, are autonomic preganglionic efferent fibers. Among the own myelinated fibers, some are somatic, carrying protopathic pain. Others are autonomic, carrying postganglionic efferent fibers. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. The Lloyd classification includes all sensory modalities. A. True, B false. The Lloyd classification includes muscle and tendon sensory fibers and nociceptive fibers. The muscle sensory fibers themselves include the primary nerve endings, fibers that arise from the back, intrafusal fibers, and the secondary nerve endings that arise from the chain fibers in the intrafusal organelle of the muscles. In addition to the fibers specifically carrying pain, the fibers from Pacinian, Ruffini, Meissner, and Mercro corpuscles are included in the Lloyd classification because they, if injured, can send pain signal to the central nervous system. Therefore, they are also considered, or they, they were also considered nociceptive by Lloyd or by the people who work with his classification. Anyway, the Lloyd classification is based on axon diameter and function. Those from the primary spindles, that is from the backs of the intrafusal organelles, have a diameter of about 13 to 21 micrometer and are labeled 1A. They arise, as we previously mentioned, from the nuclear back fibers of the muscle spindle. The fibers arising from the Golgi tendon organs, which ha have a diameter between 12 and 18 micrometers, are labeled 1B. You can see a cartoon representation of them in this frame pointed by the arrow. Next in this classification are those fibers measuring 6 to 12 micrometers. They are labeled type 2. They also arise from the muscle spindle, but they arise from the nuclear chain fibers. Those fibers with a diameter of 1 to 5 are labeled type 3 and classified as fast nociceptive fibers. And those measuring 
from 0 0.5 to 2 micrometers are classified as type 4 and labeled slow nociceptive fibers. As we previously mentioned, the primary spindle fibers are by far the fastest conducting fibers in the body. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Which of the following cutaneous fibers conduct the fastest? A. From Pacinian. B. From follicles endings. C. From cold and warm receptors. B. From myelinated fibers. The thickest and fastest fibers are those from patient corpuscles that mediate pressure. In this frame, I am presenting the cutaneous nerve classification. These fibers are followed in a speed by those arising from the hair follicles. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. Nerve motor fibers are classified in types. The motor classification is based on the innervation of different structures within the muscle and they correspond to the thickness of the muscle fibers they innervate. Alpha motor neurons have a diameter of about 9 to 18 micrometers. They arise from the alpha motor neurons in the anterior horn. The beta motor neurons also arise from the anterior horn in the spinal cord and they have a diameter ranging from 6 to 12 micrometer. The gamma motor fibers, they have a diameter of 1 to 7 micrometer and they arise from the lateral horn of the spinal cord. So the answer to this question is A. Next question, how fast does a 1A fiber conducts? A, 80 to 120 meters per second, B, 50 to 70 meters per second, C, 30 to 40 to 40 meters per second, D, 20 to 30 meters per second. The resistance to internal current flow is inversely related to axonal diameter. A way of finding the conduction velocity of a fiber is by multiplying its diameter by 6. This works for myelinated fibers. A way to determine the speed of conduction of a nerve is to take the diameter of its largest axon, multiply it by 6, and then divide it by 2. So the answer to this question is A, 80 to 120 milliseconds. That's referring to the fibers, not to the nerves. To the nerve, you will have to divide that by 2, as we just mentioned. Next question. Which nerve fibers are more excitable to electrical stimulation? A, 1 micrometer myelinated axon, B, 6 micrometer unmyelinated axon, C, 9.5 micrometer unmyelinated axon, D, 8 micrometer myelinated axon. Nerve fibers become excited 
based on the current density going through them. The current density is directly proportional to the magnitude, that is the amount of milliamps per milliseconds, and inversely proportional to the area occupied by the current. In general, given a similar current density, thicker or millinated axons are easier to excite than thin ones and axons of the same diameter when co covered by myelin are more easily excited than if unmyelinated. The increased excitability may be due to current being concentrated at the node of Randier, thus increasing current density at that point. So, the answer to this question is D. Next question. Myelinated axons are more easily excitable by increasing the magnitude of the current than similar size axon with no myelin. There are many factors that influence nerve excitability. Among them, are axonal diameter and myelination. We are weak to stimulate a nerve using a small and a large current, as represented by the red rays that you can see over the left side of the screen. We would find that A current using many milliamps will excite myelinated and non-myelinated axon regardless of the size alike. Whereas a current using few milliamps will excite thick or myelinated axons but not excite thinner unmillinated axons and if instead the axon is myelinated a smaller stimulus will excite a myelinated axon of a given size but will not excite an unmillinated axon of the same size size. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Increasing the duration of a submaximal stimulus will excite intrafusal back fibers before extrafusal motor fibers. A true, B false. Take a few seconds to look at this frame you will notice that the duration of the stimulus affects motor and sensory fibers slightly differently. Motor fibers are less sensitive to duration than sensory fiber. Increasing the duration while maintaining the same milliamps will selectively excite sensory fibers. So the answer to this question is True. Next question. Which of the following statements is true? A. Larger fibers are preferentially activated using submaximal current with relative long pulse duration of 500 to 1000 microseconds. B. Shorter duration stimulus produces proportionally greater activation of motor than sensory nerves. C. Cutaneous sensory fibers usually have a lower threshold to a stimulation than do motor fibers. D. All of the above. Larger fibers are preferentially activated using submaximal current with relatively long pulse duration of 500 to 1000 
microseconds. Shorter duration stimulus produces proportionally greater activation of motor than sensory nerves. Cutaneous sensory fibers usually have a lower threshold to stimulation than do motor fibers. As you can see in this frame, I have added the books from which these statements come from. The later statement is made in Preston's book and they take as evidence the fact that if you were performing a test on a patient, decide to try the stimulation on yourself, you will feel it before you see your own hand jerking or whatever uh, area you are performing the test on. But uh, the question is whether instead of stimulating the nerve in those occasions, you are directly stimulating the receptors. And that being the reason why you feel it, not necessarily because the nerve is stimulated. So the answer to this question, as it, sta as it states in the current literature, is D, all of the above. Which of the following nerve conduction studies most likely evaluates fastest conducting fibers? A, motor nerve conduction, B, sensory nerve conduction, C, mixed nerve conduction, D, all of the above. Mixed nerve conduction studies evaluate the fastest conducting fibers. The fastest fibers are those carrying information from muscle spindles, from the primary nerve endings of the back fibers. Those fibers are called 1A fibers. The answer to this question is C. Next question. Most nerve conduction studies are performed using a pulse with a duration of and an intensity of A, 2 seconds and 100 millivolts, B, 200 milliseconds and 15 microvolts, C, 1000 milliseconds and 50 milliamps, T, 200 microseconds and 50, 15 milliamps. When using needle, the duration of a stimulus should be about 50 microseconds. In a lab for brachial plexus surgery, we use a starting current of about 15 milliamps and increase up to 60 milliamps if necessary. At times, we also manipulate duration. As you can see in this chart, most books do not agree on the intensity and duration of current needed to stimulate a nerve. Yet, when you are in a lab, you just gotta do what you have to do to get them excited or to rule out that they can be excited or that you are actually not dealing with nerve tissue. Anyway, in general, most book recommends 15 milliamps as a starting point and a duration of 100 microseconds. For nerve conduction, the biggest discrepancy is in the duration of the stimulus. In Preston's book, the duration is given in milliseconds. Kimura and Dimitru give the duration in microseconds. For sensory evolved potential, the duration should be about 50 milliseconds and the intensity should be two to three times more than when the patient feels the current for the first time. Sick nerves may take more duration and more current, as pointed out by Kimura. 
age reflex also requires a longer duration of a stimulus. Age reflex is done using submaximal currents aimed at stimulating the 1A fibers from the muscle spindles before the motor fibers. So the answer to this question is D. Next question, supramaximal stimulation, a stimulus 25% larger than a maximum stimulus. A maximal stimulus, and a stimulus after which an increasing current amplitude fails to increase the amplitude or the onset latency of a wave. A true, B false. In this frame, I am representing current intensity by the size of the arrow. It is assumed that the duration is kept the same. The aim of nerve stimulation is to excite all fibers in a nerve. After locating a nerve as we have mentioned before, the intensity of the stimulus is increased and as such the negative wave will also increase and it would also appear sooner. This process will continue in following trials as seen in this new frame. This will be continued until a point arrives when the negative wave will no longer get bigger or appear sooner. Then the prior trial is considered the maximal stimulus and a final stimulus 25% above the maxima is applied. It is the parameters that result from this stimulation that, is, that are used for calculations. So the answer to this question is A. True. Next question. All measurements made in nerve conduction studies are based on the assumption that all of the axons of the nerve being studied have been depolarized. A true, B false. Stimulation is usually done proximately and distally in the course of a nerve conduction study. The aim is to excite all fibers at both points. The stimulation of all fibers is assumed by the use of supramaximal stimulation. This is indicated in this frame by all the little circles inside the yellow structure being green. But at times, this may not be the case. That is, the supramaximal stimulation exciting all the axons in a nerve. At times during proximal stimulation only some axons are excited. This is represented in this frame by some of the small circles inside the yellow structure being gray. And the same can be said about distal stimulation. Stimulation of some but not all fibers in a nerve can lead to wrong conclusions. So, in properly performed nerve conduction studies, proximal and distal stimulation involves all fibers. So, the answer to this question is a true. In most motor nerve conduction studies commonly used in clinical neurophysiology, the wave resulting from proximal stimulation should be no more than 10% smaller than the one resulting from distal stimulation. A true, B false. 
if all fibers are stimulated distally, that is close to the muscle, the wave created will have certain size and contour. A more proximal stimulation, also exciting all fibers, all nerve fibers, will create a similar wave as shown in this frame. Both waves will be about the same amplitude and shape. So the answer to this question is true. Proximal submaximal stimulation and distal supramaximal stimulation will produce a wave pattern that resembles a conduction block, b anomalous innervation in the receiving nerve, c both. Submaximal proximal stimulation and distal supramaximal stimulation produces a very interesting pattern. In the upper half of this frame, I have represented a normal muscle and nerve receiving supramaximal stimulations distally and proximally and producing a similar compound action potential that is a similar looking wave. I will use the lower example to explain what happens when distal stimulation is supramaximal and proximal stimulation is submaximal. The distal excitement of all fibers will produce a wave with certain characteristics. But if the proximal stimulation does not excite all fibers, the compound muscle action potential, that is the wave that will be produced, will be smaller. Such findings resemble a conduction block. In an anomalous innervation, there is a donating nerve and a receiving nerve, as expressed in this frame. Distal and proximal supramaximal stimulation of the receiving nerve can produce a compound muscle action potential pattern like the one produced by supramaximal distal stimulation and submaximal proximal stimulation. This pattern will also have the same characteristic as a conduction block. So the answer to this question is both. Next question. During motor nerve conduction studies, submaximal distal stimulation and supramaximal proximal stimulation is likely to produce a pattern resembling A, a normal nerve, B, a conduction block, C, an anomalous innervation in the donating nerve, D, none of the above. The parameters represented in this frame are those in the question. Distally, some fibers were excited, while proximally, all fibers were excited. Again, in this frame, the upper half depicts normal compound muscle action potentials resulting from distal and proximal supramaximal stimulations, while the lower half shows what happens when distal stimulation is submaximal and proximal stimulation is supramaximal. Distal stimulation will produce a smaller wave than proximal stimulation. I call this pattern the funny pattern because of because if you see it, it 
there's nothing wrong with the patient. It is either that you made a mistake in the setting of the stimulator or the patient has a benign anatomical variant. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. All of the following can produce a conduction block appearance except A, a conduction block, B, an anomalous innervation, C, a submaximal distal stimulation, D, a submaximal proximal stimulation. A conduction block certainly can produce a conduction block pattern despite normal stimulation proximally and distally. So, what will happen if in an anomalous innervation we, we study the receiving nerve? In such a case, despite using supramaximal stimulation proximal and distally, we will get a conduction block-like appearance. Sub-maximal proximal stimulation will also produce a conduction block-like appearance, but sub-maximal distal stimulation will not. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. Inadvertently, Inverting the pulse of the stimulator does not affect A. Sensory conduction velocity B. Motor conduction velocity C. Distal motor latency D. Mixed nerve conduction velocity Measuring distance for nerve conduction should be made from the cathode to the recording electrode. If by mistake the poles are inverted and measurements are still taken from the prong closest to the recording electrode, calculations made using two points will be affected. So distal motor latency will be affected. All Distal sensory nerve latencies will also be prolonged, while mixed and sensory nerve conductions will be delayed. Motor conduction, on the other hand, that is motor conduction velocity, which is calculated between a distal and a proximal site, will remain unchanged. The motor conduction velocities do not change because the error is present at both stimulation sites, thus cancelling each other out. So the answer to this question is B. Motor conduction velocity. Next question. The constellation of findings that result as the consequence of inverting the position of the cathode and the anode while doing nerve conduction studies will result in an abnormal study resembling A. Polyneuropathy B. Myasthenia gravis C. Myotonic dystrophy D. All of the above An inadvertently positioned stimulator so as to place the anode closest to the recording electrode will lead to a discrepancy between the real distance from the stimulated nerve site to the recording electrode and the measured distance between the distal prong of the stimulator and the recording electrode. 
In this frame, I have marked the real distance in magenta and the calculated distance in aqua. The constellation of finding occurring as a consequence of inverting the positions of the cathode and the anode include a delay in distal motor latency, a delay distal sensory nerve latency, a slowing sensory conduction velocity, but normal motor conduction velocity. This constellation of finding may suggest a distal entrapment neuropathy and polyneuropathy. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. The anode of a stimulator can effectively depolarize a nerve if sufficient current is delivered. A true, B false. We already mentioned that an auto block does not occur in clinical setting. Furthermore, an anode discharge strong enough can produce depolarization by unknown mechanisms. One possible explanation is the driving of positive charges into the axon. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Which of the following steps would you do to avoid stimulus artifact? A. Place ground between a stimulator and recording electrodes. B. Ensure stimulator position is optimized directly over the nerve. C. Increase the distance between the stimulator and the recording electrodes. D. All of the above. There are eight things you can do to avoid stimulus artifacts. First, place the ground between the stimulator and the recording electrodes. Second, reduce the electrode impedance mismatch to less than 200 ohms in all electrodes. Third, use coaxial recording cables. Fourth, use lowest possible stimulus to achieve supramaximal stimulation. Fifth, ensure that the cathode is directly over the nerve. Sixth, rotate the anode as I am showing you in this frame while maintaining the cathode on the nerve. Seventh, increase the distance between the stimulator and the recording electrodes. And eighth, ensure that the cables are uncrossed. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Rio base refers to the minimal current strength below which no response occurs even if the current lasts infinitely or at least 300 milliseconds. A true, B false. Four parameters influence continuous stimuli. The area of the cathode, which is given 
in millimeters and is determined by the manufacture of the probes. The intensity or amplitude of the electrical discharge, which is usually measured in milliamps, and in clinical practice usually ranges from 1 to 100 milliamps. The duration of the stimulus, which is measured in milliseconds, and the usual range being from 50 microseconds, that is 0 0.05 milliseconds, and 1 millisecond. Longer stimuli are sometimes used. And at times, the rate. The rate is given in hertz. The usual range is from 1 to 50 hertz. Two of the manageable parameters. Intensity and duration are inexorably related. They are fundamental to understand the term real base. I will explain real base in the following frames. On the y-axis that I have just drawn, I will present intensity. In the x-axis, duration. On the left side of the frame, I have introduced three terms, trials, milliamps, and milliseconds. The number of trials is 1 to 4. On the bottom, I have included the legend. The ray represents stimulus. The lines I have just added represent positive response. And the lines with a red line indicates no response. Let's say that in the first trial we use a stimulus of 1.9 milliamps for 233 milliseconds, which I have plotted in the chart, as you can see. This stimulus will not trigger a response in this case, which is totally hypothetical. I will therefore indicate the lack of response in this trial by the red X under the trial. Next trial, I will use a duration that will be the same, but the intensity will be raised to 2 milliamps, as indicated by the position of the ray in the chart. This trial triggers an action potential. I will indicate the success of this trial by placing a check mark under the second trial. Now I will move to the third trial. In this trial, the intensity will be brought back to what it was when there was no response but the duration will be increased. What we are trying to do is to determine if an increase in duration is capable of triggering a response at an intensity not capable to do so before. So in this hypothetical example, we will use 1.9 milliamps with a duration of 235 milliseconds. 
such a stimulus will not produce a response. A fact that I will document by placing a red cross under the third trial. Next, we go to the fourth trial. In the fourth trial, the duration is increased to 300 milliseconds, while the intensity is kept at the same level as in the third trial. As indicated in the chart by the location of the ray. And again, no response is obtained in this hypothetical case. I am documenting the lack of response by an X under the fourth trial, as you can see. Thus, the Rio base is established at 2 milliamps because it is the minimal current intensity capable of producing a response regardless the duration. That is the current below which no response occurred despite increasing duration. The 300 millisecond has been chosen as an alternative to infinity So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Cronaxis refers to the minimal duration of current required to excite the cell at thrice the real base. A true, B false. Once the real base is established, The process to determine chronaxis is easy. Since in this case we have determined that the real base is 2 amps, and by convention the current used to determine chronaxis is twice the real base, so in this case it will be 4, we need to try stimulus with different duration to establish which is the least duration capable of producing a response. So let's say that in this case we start with a duration of 99 milliseconds. So we stimulate the nerve with 4 milliamps for 99 milliseconds and nothing happens. So, 99 milliseconds is not the chronaxis. Then, we use 100 milliseconds. So, this time we stimulate the nerve with 4 milliamps for 100 milliseconds. And we get a response. So, we have found the chronaxis. which is 100 milliseconds, and you do not need to perform any further trials. The chronaxis, as previously mentioned, is 100 milliseconds. So the answer to this question is false. This is the end of this session. Thank you very much.